Okay, good afternoon. Uh, welcome if you are joining us live um, and anybody who is joining uh, and watching the recording at any point in time. Uh, we are very grateful that you are once again choosing to spend time with us. We know that your time is very, very precious. And so any time you ever choose to spend that with us, we are most uh, grateful and feel quite privileged. Um, we are going to talk this afternoon about um, Beyond the Basics with Google EDU. Um, and I will wholeheartedly admit that the description that I wrote for this workshop was arguably the vaguest thing I've ever written. So apologies for that. Um, but it was very much like, let's do some stuff that's not just for beginners, but sort of challenges people to think um, a bit beyond some of the, I guess, core tools that we talk about when we're talking about G Suite for Education. Um, and then I write, them, I write my description a little bit vague because it gave us quite a lot of flexibility to um, pivot um, and we are quite happy. I, know I shouldn't use pivot because we're in 2021 now and we should totally leave that in 2020. But it does give us the flexibility to, um, if there is something that any of you particularly want us to cover this afternoon, we are really happy to um, do that as well. Um, but before we jump into that, Chris, could you just go to the next slide? Sure can. Uh, we do want to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land. Um, I am in Melbourne, so um, my traditional custodians are the Wandry people of the Kulin Nation. But you'll see here we've got this great visual representation of uh, the traditional custodians from lots of different places around the country. So just take a moment to um, acknowledge whoever your traditional custodians are for when you are wherever you are joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, and we do pay our respects to their elders, both past, present and emerging. Um, and this awesome artwork, it is down the bottom. If you did want to check it out, you can actually get it. I think it's even Creative Commons licensed um, online. So it's it's a really, I think it's beautiful um, the way that they've displayed this. So Otis Hope Carey. That's, why is that so small on my screen? For some reason, that's really small on my screen. Um, but um, yeah, check that out as well. Okay, next slide. Oh, look at that. Magic. Uh, so uh, if I haven't met you before, hello, uh, my name is Kimberly. Um, I work with the Google for Education team based out of Melbourne. Uh, and um, I am very, very privileged to get to work with a lot of the departments of education. I specifically focus sort of on the southern half of the country, I sort of think. So Victoria, South Australia and Tasmania. Um, and, but also get the privilege of working with lots of great schools and educators all around um, the country, I guess. Chris? Yeah, and I'm Chris Betcher. I'm sure I've met many of you. Well, I feel like I know some of you. Uh, also on the Google for Education team, was a teacher for many years, uh, taught originally art, then technology and design and multimedia and all that cool stuff. Um, and then sort of drifted out of there into teacher education, professional learning, and wound up here on the EDU team at Google, where I mainly look after our certifications, reference schools, uh, Google educator groups, and just general sort of supporting teachers in the use of our tools. And I used to teach English and humanities and IT, which is also cool, Chris. Maybe not as fun as the subjects you just described, but also cool. Um, okay, so this afternoon, um, as I said, we're going to jump in and talk about um, some tools beyond the basics. So um, many of you are aware, and if you're not, that's totally fine. Um, when we talk about G Suite for Education, we talk about a core suite of tools where we're talking about docs, drive, forms, sheets, slides, all of the classroom, all of those tools that are like the fundamentals to your everyday using um, and interacting, collaborating, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, but we also are really lucky to have access to um, this whole other world of um, tools and resources that exist. Um, this afternoon, we're going to particularly focus on um, what we call our the additional tools that are available through um, G Suite and through the admin console. Um, but there are also um, an amazing array of partners that Google works with all around um, the world, uh, tech partners who develop really cool stuff that just amplifies um, the use of many of our tools. So we're going to showcase, just uh, talk through the different locations to find them. Now, um, uh, you guys are all coming, uh, joining us this afternoon from different locations, uh, and that means that you will all have different setups. Um, and so what we will actually do at the end is um, we have a sort of key contact email for like the digital learning team in the department in Victoria, um, the T4L team in New South Wales, and the technology team in technology adoption team in South Australia. And if there are specific things that you want to know about access to particular tools, etc., um, we'll encourage you to reach out to them. 
Some of you might be in your own school domain, so you've set up G Suite on your own, so you probably can do whatever you want, um, but we realize that there's a lot of different configurations and options. Um, so we're quite cognizant of that. And um, our decision to talk about the specific tools are that, um, you know, we're gonna focus on ones that are free um, and available and as much as possible actually um, produced by Google um, rather than them being tech partners. We could spend, Chris and I could spend what, approximately 27 hours talking about our tech partners tools um, because there are some phenomenal ones out there, but, um, because everybody is joining us from different places, we want to make sure that whatever we cover, um, the majority of you will have access to. Mm. All right, so Chris, do you want to jump in and tell us about the first really cool place that you could find? Uh, sure, then there's really three locations I want to talk to you about and, and places where you can find additional functionality for both Chrome and G Suite. Uh, and one of us, one is the Chrome Web Store. Um, and if you have never been there, um, First of all, I'm surprised, but uh, I'm sure most of you have stumbled across it at some page, uh, some stage. But it's worth spending a little time in here because there's a really lot of great stuff in here. Uh, you can get to it. The easiest way I find to get to it is if you're on a Chromebook, you just press the uh, search button. Can I just come out of here, Kimberly? Um, I'm on a Chromebook here. If I press the search button on a Chromebook, it will. Why is it not? Oh, oh that overlay doesn't come up. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Are you showing your whole screen or just the window? Uh, no, I'm presenting the whole... No, I do oh, not. I can't see well, you. I've got to do the whole screen. Okay. Yeah, Let you're showing your whole screen. Right. So Chris and I will just work through how to use Google Meet. If you can just all give us a minute. <laughs> <that'd be good. laughs> uh, yeah, all right. Let's do that. Sorry. Um, so I did just put the link in. I like how you said that you would go to the search button on a Chromebook. Um, I am very much a person that doesn't remember the URL or shortcuts to anything. Yeah. I literally that, open a new tab and search for everything. That's really the other thing. Okay, but, so I'm going to sort of share my entire screen and see if that solves this. So there's share and sharing my screen. And hopefully you see that now. Yeah, now we can see okay. you. All right, okay. So let me just go back to, uh, just go to a new tab. So it's a nice clean thing to look at. Um, so on the Chromebook, you've got this button. They called it the everything button, but it's it's the one over where the uh, caps lock would normally be on a regular keyboard. If you just tap that, this little bar appears at the bottom of the screen. This search bar at the bottom of the screen actually searches everything. So if you type a search in there, it searches not only uh, your device, but also the settings, your web, uh, your applications. Like it searches everything, hence it being called the everything key. Um, if I just type it, and you can see Web Store is actually uh, right there. But if it wasn't just there, I would just go in here and type WEB. It pops up there, and boom, you're straight into the web store. If uh, that seems like too many steps, as Kimberly said, you can just open a new tab, type in the word web store, and Google search for it, and that gives you the same result. Once you're in the web store, um, there's a couple of different categories in here. There's extensions, which are things that give more superpowers to your browser. There's themes, which change how your browser looks. So if you want to change the color scheme, add pretty pictures into the background or something, that's what themes do. There's apps, and I believe apps only work on Chromebooks. I don't think they work on other platforms now. So um, if you're on a Chromebook, you'll see apps. If you're on a non-Chromebook, you won't. And there's also a link there to games as well. You can also filter things by whether they run offline, whether they're made by Google, whether they're free, whether they're available for Android. So there's all these filters down here as well. And you can also search by ratings. And I would generally not, unless there was a really good reason for it, I would not search, I would not use an app that was, say, less than four stars, typically, because I think, you know, especially if you've got lots of ratings. So if you come in here and you're looking for a particular thing, uh, Kimberly, give me an extension. You're the extension queen. Uh, go moat. Moat, M-O-T-E. So you type in the name of the extension there, press enter, and it comes up, and there it is right there. You can see that this one is actually installed. It says added with the little green banner. Uh, but if I go to something that's not installed, like I don't really like the look of any of those, um, <laughs> can I go more extensions and see what else I find here? Uh, why have I got dress up games? What's going on? I, I think you should maybe redo a search. Search <laughs> a PDF. Search a PDF. I, I, Oh, okay. Uh, all right. So I'll do that. Uh, PDF. And like like real world problems, uh, I got a PDF. I got two PDFs recently, and I had to merge them together into one PDF. And that's actually quite tricky to do on a Chromebook. There's no native functionality to do that. But there is. Um, well, there it is. There. There's an application called PDF Merge, which does exactly that. It literally is a little extension. It asks you, give me the first PDF, give me the second PDF, stick them together for you. So there's an extension that does 
almost everything you can think of. And if you want to install one, so this one's had 87 reviews, it's five stars. That sounds pretty good to me. I'll go with that one. Click that, add to Chrome, click that little button there and add the extension and it will add it into your Chrome browser right there. Now, once it's installed, there was, a, if, you, if you've been using extensions for a while, you might have noticed there's a bit of a change to the way they work lately. They used to all just pile up across the top here. And it kind of got, if you had lots of extensions, it got a little bit clunky up here. So what Google have done recently in this new version of Chrome is they've got this little jigsaw piece puzzle now, and all your extensions sit down in this long list. And what I do like about this is actually tells you, like all of these extensions here, there is no access needed. So if you're concerned about extensions, it might be, oh, did they have access to my data? Am I, you know, do am I breaching some privacy thing? Like these ones here, all of these things don't actually require any access outside the browser at all. If you had some that did require some level of access, it would tell you, none of these do actually, uh, but it would actually tell you that, that that's the case. Um, there are some that I do use regularly, so I would like them across the top here. So what you can do is if there's, a, if there's one you do use, so here's Mercury Reader, it's currently not showing in my list at the top here, the little rocket ship, but if I wanted it to, because I use it all the time, I could just hit the pin button and now it sits in my regular collection here. So you can determine which ones you want to sit in the, the visible part of the browser window and which ones you just want to sit in the main collection. Uh, and however you access them, whether you have to um, go into this list to get them or whether you just click them from here, it's just the difference between one click versus two clicks. So it just depends on how cluttered you want that top bar to be. I'm a bit of a neat freak with my browser. I don't like lots of things everywhere. So I tend to pack them all away behind the scenes if I can. Um, yeah, and once you once you use it, if I want to use that PDF one that I just installed, I go and find it here, click that, and it pops up a little thing here, asks me to select the files, and then I click the merge button. Right, so really simple to use. Most of them are very uh, intuitive, straightforward. They do exactly what they say, and most of them just do one thing and do that one thing well. So you know, it takes very little to quote learn any of these extensions. They're just super intuitive. Hand back to you, Kimberly. Uh, can you go back to the home page for the web store just quickly? Yeah, sure. um, so one thing just to note as well, you will see in um, when you were going down extensions, themes, apps, games, just see there's a mm -hmm. for Chrome for mm -hmm. edu. So that's the domain that um, this is our training domain that we're using for today. And so this is like a curated list. So one of the options that you have when we're talking about the Chrome Web Store is to actually create a custom web store for your domain. Um, and you can choose to do that in a way like that's happened with this particular domain where it's just sort of curating some ones that are maybe used more by some of us in the training domain, et cetera. Um, or you can actually, um, but everything else is still open, or you can actually lock it down and you can say there are only these apps and extensions that are going to be able to be accessed by people um, in the domain and you actually create a store that way as well. Um, so there's a few different options, but it's, it's quite good. Now, Rebecca has asked if we can get um, Arts and Culture as an app for Chromebooks yet. Are you talking about um, through the web store or the Play Store is an Android app, Rebecca. Web Store, yeah. I think it's only an extension in the Web Store for some reason. Mm, I'm not sure. There is an extension there for it. Let's see what it does. So we go there, add to Chrome. I feel oh, like it just oh, oh, this is the one that just puts the background in every time you open a new tab, I think. Yeah, yeah. so I wanted to use it. Um, so I could access the camera with the children as well and the other features like it does on my own personal devices. Right. I haven't tried this, but I mean, in fact, that's the next thing I was going to talk about if I go back to our slides. We talked about the Chrome Web Store as being one place where you can find a lot of, you know, apps, extensions, themes and everything else for Chrome. Uh, but the second thing, thanks for the nice segue there, is the Play Store and Android apps. Now, if you've got an Android phone, you're probably familiar with the idea of the Play Store uh, if you're an Apple user, you've probably got a thing called the App Store. Play Store is sort of Android, like Android's version of that. Um, and it's a place where you can install apps on your phone. The neat thing about it is if your domain allows it, you can actually install Android apps on a Chromebook. Now, some do, not every domain allows that. So, you know, just your mileage may vary. Just take, take what I say carefully there. Uh, but if it's allowed, you can install an Android app on your Chromebook and run it. So there is an Android app for... Uh, arts and culture on the phone, which means theoretically you can run it here on Chrome as well. Now I haven't tried it, so I don't know. Some some Android apps work really well as they scale up to the bigger screen, bearing in mind most of them are designed for a phone screen, right? So 
uh, some some of them, the developers have taken the time to think through what would this like, look like on a bigger screen and they've made it work, uh, and others haven't done that extra work, so, you know, it can look a bit funny sometimes. Uh, I really should test the arts and culture. I don't think arts and culture does, um, Rebecca, to your point, because I, I, I literally tried to install it on my Pixelbook Go before. Um, uh, so, but, because, yes, to your point, Rebecca, and there's, um, we did talk about this just before, there are lots of our apps and things that we have that are available through Chrome you can also access through Android. So a couple of good examples are um, Jamboard and Google Keep, where if you have the mobile version of those, um, like Google Keep, for example, we're going to go into, but, you know, you can do voice annotation straight into it. Um, and you can do that through the Android, like you can do the Android version of it versus the Chrome version of it. Um, so I was hoping the same thing as you, that arts and culture, we could do like, you know, some of the augmented reality stuff um, through my Chromebook, but I couldn't get it to work. So um, we need to take that feedback. Chris, can you make that happen by like next week? Yeah, sure, no worries. Um, I, will, I will point out too that in terms of the Play Store, unlike the Chrome Web Store, where unless you restrict it, uh, you have access to everything, with the Play Store running on Chrome, uh, you only get the apps that are approved by your administrator. So it's not, not, it's not open slather. They have to be uh, pre-vetted and pre-approved. Yeah, so the Play Store works solely on an allow list basis. Mm. Um, uh, and, it, and it's very much because we are talking about um, a store that's designed for mobile devices and every single one of you, I'm sure, has a mobile phone that you've gone to, you know, whatever the relevant store is for you and seen some of the apps that you can get on mobile devices. Um, and so we obviously, in an education domain, by default, um, the Play Store is switched off and you have to actually create an allow list that your... Um, your users can access. There's no way to just have it completely open in an education domain. Mm. And so that's first. First one is Chrome Web Store. Second place is the Play Store. And the third place you can find uh, additional things uh, to run in this Google environment is called the Google Workspace Marketplace, uh, which is really a marketplace or a, a store, if you like, for add-ons. So within Google Docs, Sheets, Slides, and Forms, uh, you can get uh, additional functionality by using these things called add-ons, uh, and they come from this place called the Marketplace. Kimberly, you're probably more of an expert in this than me. Is there anything you want to add about that? No, this is, um, once again, something that you can control through the domain level, so through the admin console about whether you want to leave this as something that's open or um, you can actually just create an allow list for this. Um, there are some really great ones in here, some free ones. Like I know um, in Victoria, in the Department of Education, Central Tenant, for example, there's a few that are available like Form Limiter and Autocrat. And Form Limiter literally allows you to create um, within a form like a limit of the number of people that can respond and then it just switches off and things like that. So there's just like little simple functionalities. Um, and then there you've got more advanced add-ons. Like so on the screen, we see something like Pear Deck, which um, is a really, really powerful um, tool to add to slides. Um, some of them, like Pear Deck, are freemium, which is, you know, the you know, word of 2019 or 2020, whenever that came in, but there's a free version and a paid version, um, uh, and some of them are free. But they are um, they do enable you to access a whole lot of additional um, functionality, and you can um, control that all through the um, admin level as mm. well. Cool. Uh, shall we move on? Let's uh, let's move on. Anybody get questions, thoughts, comments, wonderings, epiphanies? And um, please do feel free to chuck them in. The I was watching something before about um, thoughts, questions, and epiphanies, and I was like, it's not a word I use frequently enough. Epiphanies. So um, like yeah. Uh, so please feel free to chuck anything in the comments um, or unmute yourself if you wanted to add um, anything as well. Uh, and if there's anything that you use in your school that you love, um, also feel free to share that as well. But we're going to continue, and you can totally interject us at any point um, and go through, I guess, some of the key additional tools that we spoke about again. Um, Kate, yeah, we can give you access to the slide deck at the end. We'll sure. make that available. Make yeah. that happen. Yeah. Uh, where shall we start? Well, Logically, we start in the top left-hand corner, but that okay. doesn't mean that we have to. So you right. can start. I'll let you, Chris. You can, like, you know, lottery style, whatever I, one you I love want. it. I've done three one-and-a-half half-hour workshop sessions for someone else today, and I, I spent one of them talking about Google Earth. So I'm, I'm in the groove. 
Would you like to start talking about Google Earth? Sure, then? I love Google Earth. I, I reckon it's one of the most uh, underrated tools that Google do. It's not technically an, a, a specific education tool, although a couple of years ago, the people on the education side of Google and the people on the Maps uh, Google Earth side of Google started a conversation together and actually said, you know, this is a pretty useful tool for education. Maybe we should bring it together a bit. And so when you go to Google Earth now, there's a whole bunch of education related stuff in there that wasn't there before. Um, and I think a lot of people aren't aware of that. Uh, so let me just go in here and show you, uh, open a new tab here. And um, as you probably heard me say yesterday, if you were in here, like the secret not secret, the, um, you know, the pattern for most Google tools is name of tool.google.com. So earth.google.com to get to Google, uh, Google Earth. Uh, once you get in here, um, the neat thing about the Google Earth now is it used to be, if you have long memories, you might recall it had to be installed on your computer and therefore you know, it was Windows or Mac and it wouldn't run on a Chromebook and you, know, you had to talk to your IT department and all that sort of palaver. Now it's a, just, it runs in Chrome. So it runs in any Chrome browser. So it runs in Chromebooks now. You don't have to ask permission to do it. It's just it's just there. When I say that, I suppose someone could turn it off in the admin console, but let's hope they don't do that. Um, you come in here and you click Google. Uh, I, Google. That. I actually think it's off by default, Chris, and you have to allow it as an additional oh, service. That's a so, bummer. Mm, yeah. Okay. So I've just loaded that up. I've just gone full screen on the Chromebook here. Now, I will say, just preemptively here, say that, uh, I am running this on a relatively powerful Chromebook, but Google Earth is kind of heavy on the processor. Plus, I'm also video conferencing to you know a dozen, couple of dozen people here. So this is placing a fair load on my computer at the moment, primarily because I'm also running a video call at the same time. Uh, normally, it's no problem just on the computer. So if we do get any slowness or lag, I'm just apologizing in advance. It's just I'm pushing it pretty hard doing two things at once here. So um, this is uh, Google Earth. Let me just back out here a little bit. Um, and you'll see there is our lovely planet just floating in space there. If I back out enough, you'll see I should get some clouds on it. And those clouds just magically appear. Um, those clouds are not just someone at Google who thought, let's splash a bit of white on there because it looks realistic. That's actually real weather data that's no more than 20 minutes old. Uh, and they actually paint the clouds on based on uh, real data. Uh, so I can turn around here. It's a beautiful day here in Sydney. And sure enough, there's no cloud over us right now. Now. Um, if the cloud stayed there, it'd be a bit hard to see where we're going. So if you do zoom in beyond a certain point, the clouds are magically taken away so you can see what you're doing. Now, this is probably the most realistic digital model of our planet that we have. It's made up of thousands, probably millions of digital images that are taken from space and increasingly from aeroplanes. Yes, aeroplanes um, to get lots of detail and all stitched together. I don't know how it works. It's magic. Um, but the reason I think this is such an amazing tool is I think when you see something like Google Earth, a lot of teachers would kind of go, oh, that's a useful thing for geography. But they don't think about all its other uses. Like I was showing it to this group of teachers this morning. One of them was a religious education teacher. And she said, oh, um, I, I could go have a look at Mecca and I could go and have a look at you know, the Vatican and the Wailing Wall. And like she had all these plans in her head for how she could use this with her students. I had a science teacher who said, oh, can I go and have a look at the Large Hadron Collider? Uh, it doesn't matter what you teach, you can probably find a use for it in here using Google Earth. So uh, to show you a couple of things here, the, the first thing I just wanna, I usually start by showing people is um, a search function. So there's a little search button up in the top here. So if I search for, uh, I happen to be in a suburb called Reevesby right now. If I spell it right, Reevesby, there you go. Um, and it'll just zoom you into wherever you are. Oh, look at that fence there. I took an Instagram photo of that the other day. Huh. Sorry, diversion. Um, so here we are, and, and I can zoom in. Now, the zooming in and out, uh, if you've got a mouse, you can use the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. If you've got a, just a regular trackpad on your laptop, just usually two fingers, just stroking the trackpad with two fingers like that will generally scroll you in and out. So zoom in, zoom out. All I'm doing is moving two fingers on the trackpad. Okay. Now, when you zoom in, you can see you're going quite far. Um, you've probably seen Google Earth before. You know, the first thing you go and look at is your house, correct? Right? I saw you all mouth that. Um, uh, but I, you need to know how to navigate around in here because once you master that, then the world is literally your oyster, right? So if you zoom in and out, that controls the zoom. If you click and drag, that means you can drag things left or right or up and down, right? So you can move the map around. 
here's the trick that isn't very well known. If you hold down the shift key while you click and drag, you can tilt and rotate the earth. Now, if you combine, you've got tilt, rotate, dra drag left, drag right, up, down, zoom in, zoom out. In other words, you can look at the earth in any way you like, right, once you know what you're doing. So that's, uh, that's kind of handy. Down here in the corner, you've got a few little controls down here. The one I want to point out is this little person uh, whose official name is Peg Man or Peg Non-Gender Specific Person. If I click on Peg Person, um, all these blue lines appear, right? And they represent where the Street View cars have driven around. Now, we own, the, we own a, a couple of dozen cars here in Australia where we have uh, cameras on the roof that drive around and take imagery in 360 degrees. So now when I drag Mr. Peg person out here and drop him on one of those roads, it's going to zoom in. So I can see it's a little bit laggy in the stream, but hopefully you get the idea. And now this is what it's like to stand in that location right there. Right? And so I can pick this up. I can move around. Oh, I know where the street is, actually. Um, right? And if you want to move up the street, you sort of can click uh, and move up the street so you can navigate your way around. So if you want to know what it's like to be anywhere in the world, you can do that now. So, for example, you know, I, I, I live around here, so that's not terribly exciting. But if I was to go to, say, uh, I don't know, the Taj Mahal, I've never been to the Taj Mahal. But if I go there, it will fly me over to India. Zoom me in on the Taj Mahal. Res up, so I get a bit more resolution, and there it is right there. Now, same kind of thing. Let's just get rid of this for a sec. If I click on Mr. Peg person, Miss Peg person, and all those blue lines appear, same deal. If I grab this little guy here and drop him on one of those blue lines, it will take me and zoom me into that space, and now I can see what it's like to stand there. <laughs> There's this uh, lovely couple here obviously taking a selfie uh, when they contributed that photo. The photos are not only by Google. they can You can see they're also by other people who just contribute 360 photos to this. And consequently, there are millions and millions of these 360 images from all around the world that are on this map, uh, including places where Google hasn't been allowed to go. We, funnily enough, the Chinese government has not let us drive our cars around China, nor has North Korea. Um, and it's also pretty hard to go into parts of the Sahara Desert. Um, so we haven't done that, but people who have been to these places have. So when I say you can go anywhere in the world, I'm not exaggerating. You can literally go anywhere in the world, and chances are someone's been there. Want to go to anyone do a unit of work on Antarctica with their students? All right? You can go to Antarctica. Uh, anyone uh, learn, like like I said, Large Hadron Collider, go and have a look if you're a scientist. Um, teach English, go and have a look at where Shakespeare was born or, or poke around the Globe Theatre. Uh, like there is literally something for everybody in here. Um, now, uh, so that's just sort of navigating your way around. Now, there's two other things I just want to show you, and I'll try and be brief. Uh, there is a tool up here that looks like a little pirate steering wheel over in the over on the side there, right? And if I click on that, it opens up a section in here called Voyages. And Voyages is like a curated collection of interesting things inside Google Earth that you can leverage to teach with. So, for example, here's a story here about the wildlife of Africa. If I scroll down, here's one of the raptors of Montana for some, for some reason. Uh, here's uh, cherry blossoms around the world. Um, landforms, quiz on natural wonders, the sustaining humpback whales. Like there is just so much amazing stuff in here. I hope some of you have this open in another tab and you're also playing at the same time, by the way. Right? And if you want to play with any of these, it's, uh, it's, I, I like the ones in the education section here. So I'll go over to education. Like if you're a math teacher, for example, maths teacher, there's a whole thing here on the geometry of sustainable architecture. I mean, could you turn that into a maths lesson? Probably. Um, geometry of castles. Here's the thing about James Cook's first voyage. Um, kindergarten kids. Here's a whole thing here about letters of the alphabet as seen from space made by natural landforms. I mean... What a cool thing to do with your young kids, picking out letters uh, on, on the earth. So, you know, pick something that interests you, that you think is fascinating. Uh, math and architecture. Here's the whole thing about circular structures. When I click on that to go into it, it launches this uh, story, this voyage, that tells a story about this theme of math and architecture. If I click on the Explore button, what it will do, you can see those red pins there. These are various places around the world where it wants to tell you something about the world. 
that's related to this idea of circular structures and maths. And so this one here in Pueblo Bonito in Chaco Canyon, uh, MN, what's that? Minnesota? New Mexico? No, I don't know what that is. MN. Not sure. But I can zoom in and out. I have all my usual Google controls over here. I can click and drag and rotate, look at the landscape. And you can see this particular little story has five chapters in it. I'm on chapter one in Pueblo Bonito. If I click the button, it's going to fly me to the next place to look at, which is the Roman Colosseum. And boom, it flies me in there. And now I can get a pretty good look there. Now, you notice that this particular place, this is in 3D. If I pick this one and look around, all the buildings are in 3D. There are some places in the world where we've collected enough data uh, on the landforms there, we can actually reconstruct the landforms digitally. Um, and this is where we use the planes to do this. So Chris, I'm giving you a one minute warning, otherwise okay. you will for the entire yeah. hour. That uh, oh, I, I, could easily, I could easily do that. Yeah, I'll try right, that. No, yeah. Like everybody, anybody who didn't know that five minutes ago is 100% aware of it now. Um, <laughs> we do have a couple of questions that um, have come in as well, which is part of my one minute warning. Um, yeah. So Rebecca was asking about, can you search the Earth Explorer? Yeah, um, you can, Rebecca. Um, and I'll, I'll just show you that. If I go back, if I come out of here, so I'll just go back to the main page, just get out of here completely. So I'm just back in regular old earth, right? If I click on the search button up here and search for something, so let's say uh, let's say I'm doing something on Anzac Day, so I want to know about Turkey. So I type in the word Turkey, and down here where it says guided tours, if there's a voyage that relates to that place, you'll find it down here in the bottom, and there's one there called the Invasion of Gallipoli, right? And in fact, I think if you go down and say more guided tours, there's probably even more. There you go. There's a whole bunch of stuff about Turkey. Often when you're looking for something like that, uh, if you search Anzac, for example, you may not find what you're looking for. So because it's a geo-based tool, often it's better to look for the place rather than the event. Um, sometimes you have more success with that. Um, Chris, so do we still have that accompanying education website that used to exist to go along with Earth? Uh, yes, there is. I will drop it in the resources or I'll find it while you're talking and I'll drop it in yeah. the chat. Yeah. I, can't, I, I did a quick search, but I didn't find it straight away. So I didn't know. We used to we we have an education. Um, I guess it's like to support educators using Earth um, yeah. website, so that you don't have to just um, search sort of blindly through Earth. Um, uh, and then Kate has asked around using this alongside expeditions. Um, the, the two are separate products. They use much of the same database. So a lot of the 360 imagery you'll find in expeditions is the same imagery we're using here in Google Earth, but they are actually two separate products. So they don't necessarily overlap. Um, just before I finish up, I, I, there's a little tool down the bottom here that looks like a ruler. And if I click on that ruler, I can say, well, there's the forecourt of the Taj Mahal. I wonder how big it is. So I could so I click in the corner there and then go up here. Oops, sorry, went too far. Click there. Click there, and you can see it's measuring out the distance for me. And if I go back to my start point and close it off, it actually says, well, the perimeter is 1.699 uh, meters, uh, thousand meters, and the area is 163,000 square meters. So, like, if you're looking for a good maths lesson or getting your kids to design a, uh, uh, you know, a half marathon course around your suburb or something, like, it's a great little tool for doing that kind of thing. And this one here, which I'm not going to spend any time on other than to tell you it exists. If you like the voyages that I showed you before, there is a tool in here now where you can make your own projects and essentially create your own voyages. So if you can't find one in there that is exactly what you want, you can simply make your own now. And they get stored straight in your Google Drive. And they're collaborative, so students can work together on a project. I love that idea because imagine a student goes on a, you go on a, you know, the year six trip to Canberra or something and the kids all go and visit the Mint and the Questacon and the gallery or whatever and then they come back to school and then they recreate and tell the story of the expedition or the, the excursion they went on in Google Earth. I think it's a way more interesting way of doing it than simply creating a, a slide presentation somewhere and you know, giving these static slides. Tell it, in, tell it in the real thing. All right, Kimberly, I'm done. That was definitely more than a minute, just for the record. So uh, you are officially fired from any timekeeping jobs. Um, so um, I thought we might jump into, do you want me to share my screen? Am I going to literally kick you off that much that uh, I'll share? What are you, you going to do now? I was going to share um, arts culture. Oh, arts culture. Uh, yeah, why don't you share? Okay. All right. I am going to jump into uh, Google Arts and Culture, which I think um, alongside um, Google Earth, it, 
personally, if I if I only had one or the other, Chris, I'd go with arts and culture over earth. Like if I could only have one of the tools. You're so wrong. Am I wrong? No, I don't know. So I think that this is the single-handedly most underutilised resource because, once again, like Earth, as Chris said at the start, like it's not designed for education, but the education um, potential within it is genuinely phenomenal. So um, it's artsandculture.google.com. I don't know that. I just Google arts and culture and it comes up first time every time. I believe um, that is the case. It is, yeah. Um, and if you haven't been here before, um, then you... Just, you, you should just just stop everything you're doing and spend the rest of the afternoon playing in arts and culture. Um, basically, it is a curation of um, amazing um, um, insights into art galleries around the world, um, places that you can visit from a cultural point of view. Um, so you can go swimming in 360 in the Great Barrier Reef. You can walk along the Great Wall of China and then you can also unpack things that are associated with that. So there are so many different ways you can use arts and culture, but I'm going to stick to my five-minute time limit um, unlike other people on the call um, and just do my, uh, like, absolute top things. Um, one of the really cool things about arts and culture, actually, that I always love is Every time I come to the homepage, there's different stuff on it. Um, so you'll see at the moment they have some new interactive features that are available, including some stuff with um, uh, Chrome experiments. Thank you, Chris. Uh, including some stuff with Chrome experiments around um, music, which is really cool. You can colour in Van Gogh's um, roses on here at the moment. Uh, you can actually turn yourself into a girl with a pearl earring. Um, so some really cool stuff in here. Now, you can do a whole range of different things. So you can just scroll through. They're constantly updating um, different stories and exhibitions and things like that that you can visit. Um, and as uh, Rebecca mentioned, oh, have I lost? Oh, I think I momentarily lost everybody. No, it's still here. Okay. As Rebecca mentioned before, um, there is an amazing um, mobile app for arts and culture as well um, where you can do a whole lot of additional stuff. So you can see as I scroll down a range of different things, one of the really cool things that's becoming more and more is this, like they've got augmented reality. I don't know how well my um, computer is going to cope with me wanting to show you this dinosaur bones in 3D through Google Meet. Um, but you can, it is pretty good. Yeah, so then you can see down here I could actually view it in augmented reality, so place it somewhere. Um, I've got a whole lot of information about this particular triceratops from the National Museum of Natural History that I can read about in here as well. And then I go on to more um, detailed stuff as well. Uh, my photo is frozen though, so my computer is no doubt struggling quite a lot right now. Mm. Um, so one of the things though that I like to do um, is is actually look at this nearby, and this is particularly you know last year when you wanted to find places that um, things near you. There you go. Just gave everybody my home address on um, recording. That's good. Um, so um, I can places that are near me, um, and then I can actually jump in and explore the um, the art that's actually on display there. And there'll be lots of um, statues and things like that from different, um, uh, you know, parks and things like that as well. Um, but if I jump in, I'm going to search for something. Let's just search for something very stereotypical. I never noticed that there's that. It tells you the exhibition is on right now and what date it's until. That's really And cool. also you can actually even buy tickets through there now as well, I noticed mm. before. So mm. if you actually have something, it'll actually say how much it costs to go and see it in real life too, which is pretty cool. And you can buy tickets straight from there. Mm. Um, so I can you can search for different things. I've searched for an artist, but I could search for um, a medium like gold or I could search for a, an, a historical event or a person or any of those sorts of things. Um, but I did Van Gogh because there's obviously going to be a lot of stuff around that so you'll see there is um 17 different collections so these are places all around the world that have developed uh collections related to this particular artist that i could go into um there's 46 stories on van gogh and you can actually jump into any of these and these are things that have sort of been curated to enable you to explore um whether it's an artist or um, a movement or a cultural thing. Um, this one you can zoom into Van Gogh's Starry Night because a lot of the artworks that are in here have been uploaded in what we call a gigapixel format. So it's like a, a trillion, billion, zillion pixels. 
Um, so you can actually get into this, definitely not the accurate number. Uh, you can actually get into the pixel level of like, okay, I can see the brush strokes, but you can see that they're actually doing this now where it actually is taking you on a bit of a guided tour through different um, sections within this piece of art, which is pretty awesome. I'll go back because how many, how long do I have on my timer, Chris? Oh, uh, I'll tell you. Oh, closed it. Uh, one minute. <laughs> Okay. So there are 831 items about Van Gogh here. And I can also, um, you'll see, like Chris's little peg man from Earth, you'll see that peg non-gender specific person um, <laughs> is here, which means that I can actually jump into any of these museums and I can actually walk around. Let's just go onto the third floor here. I don't know how well my whole computer is going to cope with this, um, but I could actually tour um, this museum and go up and see these artworks in their, I was going to say natural habitat, but I'm not sure how natural <laughs> it is, but that same sort of concept. You can go up and get more information about them. Just very finally, because I could keep talking, once again, we could talk about this um, for the whole time. One thing that I really um, think is a really cool feature, if I go back to the home, you can see all these things we could do. Um, something that can be really cool is to look at like change over time um, and that cultural link. So something like gold, um, you know, used to be like the most valuable commodity in the world. And then we now have oil and other things that people seem to care about more than gold. But it's quite interesting to track some of these things through arts and culture, whatever it is that you're looking at. Because as you go down through these different collections and number of items and things, you can see it in different places. Um, why can't I see my ability to sort this? Oh, there's my time. Oh, no. Um, why can't I sort my through time? So you can usually, maybe if I go through mediums, you can actually sort um, your collection either based on like trends. Um, so what's trending, what's hot right now. Let's just jump into any of these. What, what medium should we look at? Ceramic. Here we go. Um, or I can actually sort them um, through time as well. And I think this is a really interesting way of looking at, like, you know, how things have been represented over time through different parts of history. And gold's a really interesting one because obviously we, are, we, don't, we don't have it as much, we don't value it as much, and so it's sort of like there's heaps of it a long time ago and then we really don't see as much of it anymore, so on and so forth. Um, I need to stop because otherwise I'm going to be a hypocrite. Um, but um, you can see that... You should go right past that. <laughs> no, I'm literally going to stop. I'm going to force myself to stop by stop sharing my screen. Um, arts and culture is something you can totally, totally get lost in. Um, and um, I really encourage you just to have a play and explore and um, then, you know, set the kids free in there as well to find what they can um there is just phenomenal resources in there. All right, Chris, oh, any any questions, comments? I think people are just saying that anybody who's, lo anybody who's used it loves it. It yeah. is an amazing resource. And every time I look at it, it's like it's got more stuff in it. It just Chris, you were supposed to monitor the questions while I was speaking. So Wendy asked, can you say something that you can find? I could have shown you how to do that, Wendy. Sorry if I had read your question first. Yes, you can actually create your own sort of gallery. So you actually have this ability to favourite things within there. And then you can actually share those collections with others as well. So you can actually create um, a collection of things that you want to share. So from bits and pieces that might be, you know, the start of an inquiry unit and then you can actually share that um, with others as well quite easily so that's totally doable and it, because it's you know google and it syncs across all the different devices so you can find something on your phone or blah blah etc so on and so forth in fact if you find something interesting in arts and culture underneath it there's a little heart that you can click on and put it in your favorites collection so that's how you would kind of save it for later but next to that is that you know that little uh that little symbol for sharing things that you see everywhere. If you click the share symbol, you can send it off to Twitter or Facebook or whatever, but you can send it to Google Classroom as well. So imagine you find something in there that's a great conversation starter, a great provocation for your kids to think about. Like go in there, hit the little button, send it to Classroom, create a little task out of it, turn it into a question or something and ask your kids to respond to it. Like it's just, it's you know, three clicks and you've got an assignment built. It's, uh, yeah. it's pretty cool. Uh, all right, Chris, you have three minutes for maps because you've already spent 25 minutes on Earth. So <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> No, I'm not even joking. Three minutes. <laughs> uh, so this is Google Maps. Uh, you probably use it to navigate your way around, get to parties or whatever you do. Um, there's only one thing I want to show you in here because you probably use most of the other side of it, and that is in the little uh, drop-down menu on the side here, there's this option called Globe. So by default, Google Maps is a flat map. I'll stop it. <laughs> um, Google Maps is a flat map. 
right? But if you put it on this globe mode, what it does is it wraps the Earth down. And if you zoom out now, you can see we are actually looking at a globe, right? And if I turn that off again, if I go back to the flat mode, go back to non-globe, it flattens it back out again. Really interesting to see how orthographic projections and stuff can distort you know, the, the, the way we look at the poles especially. But if I go back to globe mode, here's a little trick about Google Maps. It's the one thing I want to show you. Go to Maps, put it in globe mode, right, like that. Then turn on satellite mode, and then it goes into, it'll overlay the Earth with a satellite. Now it looks a lot like Google Earth, right? You're not in Google Earth, you're in Google Maps. But you've done two things. You put it in globe mode, and you've turned on the satellite view. Now, use the zoom to back out as far as you can. Just grab it and back out. And when you get as far as you can out, look what happens. This list comes up on the side here of other planets. Who does a unit of work on space? Anyone? Right. So. Remember what I said, put it in globe mode, put it in satellite view, back out with the zoom as far as you can possibly go, and then this appears. So now let's go to the moon. Click on the moon, we leave Earth, fly over here, boom, there's the moon. And we can look around, we can see the dark side of the moon. We can go over to Europa, the smallest of the four Galilean moons of Jupiter, and have a squeeze at that. I reckon that's a pretty good resource. And when you want to go back to Earth, you just click on back to Earth. Uh, you can also visit the International Space Station, by the way, and that will take you to some 3D imagery of what it looks like there in the cupola of um, the front of the uh, International Space Station. Just come back out of there, go back, hit back to Earth. Uh, come on, Earth, give me back to Earth, and then zoom back in. Then I'll go and turn my map view back on, and I'm back to normal. If you want it flat again, you can go and turn off globe mode. So there's a little trick in Google Maps you might not have known about. There's a whole universe of stuff hidden away in there. Literally a whole universe. Literally. Literally. Yeah. Nice. Very impressive, Chris. That was only two minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. Do you want to open Jamboard rather than me presenting again? Do you want to just open Jamboard? Uh, sure. Jamboard.google.com. So I feel like um, Jamboard is a tool that nobody knew about until the world went into remote learning. Um, and then everyone was like, oh, my goodness, how do I get a whiteboard? And I feel like Jamboard um, became an answer for a whole lot of people. But it is literally like a digital whiteboard online. Um, because of the use of it increasing so drastically last year, they have made a heap of improvements. They, we, have made a heap of improvements uh, to it um, in, in the last six-ish months. Um, and it... Uh, is I think can be quite a great resource. Once again, there is a mobile version of this and um, the Chrome version of this and the mobile version actually has um, additional features as well. So um, I was using it earlier today through the Android version on my Chromebook um, and you have some options to add um, additional things. You can add photos, they can take a picture straight away from your camera, you can add stickers, you can do some bits and pieces um, additionally to the desktop version. Indeed. So um, the Should other thing- Should we into play or? Sure. The other thing that happened with Jamboard last year, we, we have approximately 10 minutes, and by approximately I mean we have 10 minutes left in the entire um so, so maybe let's not. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the other thing that happened with Jamboard last year is that we integrated into um, Google Meets. So Chris just went to jamboard.google.com and did this, but you could have actually um, uh, opened it and created it within the Meet, and then it would have put the link straight in the chat and others would have been able to collaborate straight away there as well. Are you yeah. showing that? Yeah, let's do that. So I'll go here, start a new whiteboard. And actually, this is good because, like, when I created the one just by going and creating it, like, at the Jamboard site, um, share with three people, turn on link sharing so anyone can edit. Let's do that. So, yeah, um, because I've created it inside of um, the Google Meet and it knows you guys are in the Google Meet, it automatically invited me. Did I, did I close that by mistake? Buffed. Where am I going? You have the link in the chat. Just click, click on the link in the chat, Chris. Uh, I, I'm on two different computers. Oh, gee. Okay. So there's a link in the chat now uh, to the Jamboard that Chris created. Um, Miriam, <laughs> oh, dear. Um, <laughs> your question. Um, no, you can't necessarily control it um, if you have made it to anyone with the link in edit or if you have shared it explicitly even with your um, students, then um, they can all edit the entire thing. So it works like a slide deck, I guess, in that way. So like Google Slides, anybody could edit anything. Same sort of deal with Jamboard. Um, and, and then I saw someone had a question about other 
uh, yeah, Rebecca, um, there have been more backgrounds already released, so I assume that it's only a matter of time before we get more and more uh, and the ability to customise them more and more and things like that as well. Um, but uh, we said this yesterday afternoon, and so I'll just reiterate it again um, now, in all of our products we have the ability for you to suggest feature changes or feature requests and, like, genuinely hand-on-heart promise that the majority of the changes that are actually made to our products are based on use feedback so if there are things that you would like to see changed um, do what Chris just just then say you've got an issue or you want to see something um, changed and then it will actually um, be listened to the product teams read every single one of these um, so not that I'm supposed to say this in recording but I always say if there's something you really want just find lots of people to submit it like <laughs> lots of times and then you know it'll get bumped up in the, the list of feature requests potentially yeah um, so if you are on a device that is touch, whether that's a tablet or, you know, a flip Chromebook or something like that, then you obviously, um, it's stylus enabled so you can annotate straight in here. Um, there are a, a couple of different background options. So there is like um, straight lines, there's graph paper, um, that sort of thing, and a few colours. Um, and then at the top, you'll see that um, we, it, they call them frames, the number of different frames that you can actually have um, for your jam. Um, and is there a limit? Is it 20, Chris, or did I make that number up? Uh, it might be 20, yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah, it sounds familiar, but I, there's a good chance I just kind of somewhat made it up. If anyone knows if there's a limit, um, then feel free. 20, good, Kerry, there you go. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, so there is a limit of 20 frames. But, you know, it can be a great thing, like, you know, adding whatever you want to different frames, getting people to contribute different ideas in each different space. Um, and then obviously yeah, you can see people have already discovering all the... I love it whenever you give access to, like, a collaborative thing with lots of people and just watching what people um, do. Whoever's writing hello with their... It looks like you're doing it with your trackpad. It's very <laughs> impressive. That's a very... If you're doing that, if you're doing that with a stylus, I apologise. Um, but... <laughs> It is, it is hard to freehand write um, with a trackpad. Maybe you guys are better at it than me. I'll just stop talking. Uh, Chris, anything on Jamboard that you wanted to cover off that I didn't mention then? Uh, no, no the, two, the two things that are new, if you haven't used it for a while, is the ability now to put a text box in there, which you couldn't do before. So you can now add uh, text in here, um, which strangely enough was not one of the original features. And the other thing is to be able to draw shapes, as somebody is demonstrating nicely here as they're drawing half a frog or something. Um, yeah, so so there's that. And I, I can assure you there will be more stuff coming into Jamboard. I think uh, I think we've realized what a cool tool it is, especially over the last uh, you know eight, eight months or so. So I yeah. imagine it will grow even better. Um, I actually saw this afternoon on Twitter and re retweeted it that um, Canva now has a whole lot of um, backgrounds that you can download um, as well. Mm, um, um, and so, like, I was like, oh, you could use them to base things off. Um, Kate, you cannot add audio yet. Um, but the next tool we were going to speak of, which doesn't have all of these functionalities, um, but does have the ability to add audio, is Google Keep. So we might, Chris, and final, did, just five so minutes. You, you may have mentioned this and I wasn't listening properly. Did you mention the fact that you can put your own backgrounds in? I know I said that we can. Um, I said that you could change all your backgrounds and increase. Right. But you could, you could drag, grab one of those Canva backgrounds and chuck them straight in here. There was a really great one I saw. It was just like a, a simple like mood check-in thing that was already pre-made for you, and then you know the kids could drop in how they were feeling. Um, because we are seeing it's it's interesting because um, you know the state of the rest of the world um, and not ours. Touch wood. Um, hopefully, is that there's so many people still remote learning and teaching that um, we're seeing some really great innovation and other other companies producing really cool stuff that uh, that we can um, in, it help us in this space as well. So yeah, uh, the, there is just one last thing: the ability to download the whole thing as a PDF once you're done. So if you do use it for a class brainstorming session, and I mean it will obviously save as a jam file, but you can also download it as a PDF in case you want it in that format as well. Or an image, so you could you can download it as yep. an image and then save it into a slideshow, for example, or a slide deck, or wherever you want, really. But you know, yep. pull it straight down into um, you know a Google Slides thing for whatever okay. capturing. All right, let's All right. go. Can you go keep, please? Keep, uh, sure. 
Uh, I feel like we're doing a demo slam now with how much I'm trying to speed us up. So <laughs> please do continue to ask any questions, comments, wonderings, epiphanies uh, in the chat. Oh, look at that. Who's that handsome fellow? Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, did, I did bring Keep Up in a large screen in front of a large crowd one time, and it was my personal Keep, and there were things in there that, well, let's say they were personal. <laughs> <laughs> It's like every time I ever demonstrate Gmail and then I get in my own and I'm like, oh, I haven't looked in my Gmail for the last half an hour. I do not know what emails will be in my inbox. So Exactly right. right. Where, this, where this works really best, though, is when you use it in conjunction with a mobile device because the, they sync automatically. So, I mean, on a personal level, you can see I've got a shopping list there. And right under here, it says Woolworth Reesby. This is actually set so that uh, if I go in here and say, uh, where's Add Reminder? Um, uh, this remind me if I go to remind me you can do it based on a time so you can have a, a pop-up reminder come up from a note at a specific time but you can also do it on a, on, a, on a place so for example this is a shopping list that when I get near Woolworths down the road it was pop up on my phone basically so don't forget the milk and eggs and I strongly recommend everybody finding out the password to their partner's phones and setting up that reminder in the shopping list that you've collaboratively shared with them as well. No, no, no. no. See, what, see, what you do is you create, a, you create the shopping list here and you share, share it so the other person also has access. And then if you've got Google Homes at home, you can just say, I won't say the word because it will go off, but you can say, hey, you know who, um, add milk to my shopping list and it will go and put it on there automatically. Oh, yeah. I Literally every day in my kitchen when I am cooking, I am adding things to my shopping list with my Google Home. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, okay. So keep, um, Rebecca, your question about um, sharing keep. Yep. So it is a, each one of these notes is completely um, collaborative. So you can add um, as many collaborators uh, to a note as you like. And one of the really cool things about Keep is that it is also now integrated into um, like docs and slides and stuff like that. So I know a whole lot of people um, use Keep for like writing notes that then they pull into docs. Uh, yeah. Rebecca, I'm going to assume you mean the whole collection of all the notes? No. So the, the whole collection of all the notes is still just only, there's no ability. It's a really, that's a good feature request. You should log that as a feature request. The ability to group notes and share like a collection of, of notes would be really cool actually. Um, so no, you cannot do that at this point. I think Chris is gonna send some feedback. <laughs> I forgot you can now have dark theme as well. Turn on dark theme if you prefer. I have dark theme on all my devices for everything. Oh, interesting, okay. So, um, hmm. So one of my favourite things about Keep is on the mobile version or also the Android version through um, a Chromebook is the ability to take um, audio notes that it also transcribes into text. Um, and so I find that really super useful um, when I, you know, got random ideas going through my head um, that I, you know, I, I talk them aloud. It saves the audio file, which I can then obviously use the audio file, but it also will transcribe it for me. So then I also can copy and paste that text into other places as well. Um, you can see Chris has got a brilliant drawing um, there that he's done of a, um, a smiley face on your keep. Okay. Yes, it's beautiful. Uh, so you can uh, draw, which once again, if you have, um, a, you know, touch the stylus, it's going to be a better experience for you. Um, but you can you can obviously you know use keep in um, uh, all kinds of different ways. It's <laughs> brilliant, Chris. Um, uh, is auto draw in app version? Uh, auto draw, as in the yeah, like auto draw .google .com, I think it is. Um, it's not like an app that you can do on a mobile device, Carrie. If that's what you're asking, it is still just a website, um, to the best of my knowledge. Um, Okay, we could talk about this for another 25 minutes, but we have no time left um, officially. Right. Um, back to the slides. So um, we didn't get through everything, which is in no way, shape or, or form a surprise to either of us, <laughs> potentially any of you who know either of us as well. Um, well, we won't, we won't get to show you any of these. We just want to mention these because... Um, we these... were going to show a couple on the next slide, but that's fine. Oh, it wasn't... Oh, oh, yeah. oh the next slide. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And, yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Oh well. Yeah, <laughs> Miriam, we can always do more sessions. Let's just. We'll just. Chris, can you just organize? We'll just organize another another sure. thing, and we'll just keep going. So. How often do you um, um. So I feel like that's probably the best thing to do because we are at time. Um, what we will do. Um. Uh, actually, Chris, can you just jump down to the Chromebook App Hub page just very quickly? 
So one thing that we did want to make sure that you were aware of in case you haven't seen it is the Chromebook App Hub. So if you Google Chromebook App Hub, you'll find it. Um, or it's Chromebook App Hub with Google.com. Uh, but basically, this is a really great resource for um, educators because you can come on here and you can search for specific ideas um, or tools. And you'll see it's, it's you can filter by apps or by ideas. Um, and then you can actually filter down by um, age level and things like that. And then um, what you get returned is a whole lot of really great um, uh, curated like lesson ideas or activity ideas or unit ideas um, utilizing um, some specific tools um, and I think if you are sort of investigating like the what is beyond the core suite I really think the app hub is a really great way of um, I guess honing in like why you're using the tool so not just using the you know oh that's a cool tool like well how could I use that in a different way or might that be applicable for what should I use if I'm talking about junior primary um, you know are there ones that are particularly good for that um, and you'll see yeah lots so lots of ideas these are all made by teachers um, in here and so there's lots of really great um, lesson unit ideas and things like that um, that you can filter through in here as well so I think it's a really great resource and I, I you know for me I always found these sorts of things as a teacher as being like a spark of an idea I would never do exactly what it says but nobody ever does I don't know I don't read recipes properly either so that could just be me um, but I never do exactly what it says but it would often give me like that spark of an idea of like oh I'd never considered using that particular tool in that particular way with that sort of age group of um, students so on and so forth okay um, <laughs> I didn't write it Okay, uh, good. All right, so Chris, can you please go back to the slide deck and bring yes, up can. the um, email address that I said we need to share? So if you have particular questions about things in your jurisdictions, we have, um, uh, these are the key contacts for South Australia, Victoria and New South Wales departments. If you are in locations other than that, feel free to hit Chris or I up and we might be able to connect you with um, a person to ask. Um, but as we said at the start, you know, there are so many of these tools um, there are in, everybody has a different um, setup in the way that they've, um, I guess, put things in place for their particular um, G Suite domain. Um, and so if there's things that you would like to know about for your particular area, if you're in one of those three government jurisdictions, they're the key uh, email addresses to jump in to see. Um, and if you can't find what you need, want help or want to chat more, Chris, can you go to the next slide, please? Sure. Um, feel free to uh, message Chris or myself as well. Um, so uh, I think we had a few questions come in and um, we are at time. So if you, if you want to drop off, please feel free to do that. Thank you for joining us again. We appreciate that. The um, recording and the transcript from the chat will be attached to the calendar within shortly sometime soon um and then um uh we will look at trying to organize a couple of additional bits and pieces over the next few weeks maybe um as well um so feel free to drop off we'll continue the recording just to answer the questions um if i jump back up a bit i think there was some questions bye to anyone who is leaving so uh da -da -da -da. Okay, and Marie, some more sort of admin tools, okay? Yeah, we could do a whole session on that for sure. Kate, we're definitely trying to get, um, uh, like I'm working really closely with the digital learning team in Victoria. So um, anything that we are doing, um, they are putting up on ARC pretty soon um, after, we advertise, after we've got it finalised. So ARC is a good place um, to keep in touch with for sure. I will continue to update there as much as possible. Um, when Wendy's asking about the Vic one, I'm not sure what that what Vic one that was. Wendy, if you're still here, yeah, we because our emails have changed from education to, from Edgemail to education, and I just noticed yep. that was an Edgemail one. Um, the yes, they're still they. I, oh, it's a very good question. I think I it still works for a little while, but I just wasn't sure whether maybe they've changed it already. They haven't told me that yet, but Wendy, I will follow that up 
um, thank you, because, yeah, I do know that um, they are all switching over. I know edge emails do generally still work um, for the corporate office. I still have an edge email, which is very, very, when I when I re got my edge email back, it actually attached me to my school that I taught at in a government. So you never actually leave your school, apparently. If you leave a department school, you never actually leave. Um, so edge emails do still work, um, but I will circle back around. So thank you for that um, prompt to double check that that's right. Um, do, 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 did I miss anything else? Do you want to stop the recorder? Oh, sure. I'll stop the recording while I keep scrolling through. Is there any other questions that I missed?